and what is up, gang? Thank you for checking out Sledgehammer TV today. AEW Dynamite follows up a very good first showing of 2020 with an extremely disappointing and mildly confusing episode this week. With the exception of the opening tag team matchup and the John Moxley double swerve on Chris Jericho at the end, everything that happened tonight was a convoluted mess, and we are here to talk about it right here and right now. My name is Nick Nightmare, and you are watching the Sledgehammer Wrestling Show's AEW Dynamite Review and Reaction Show. Let's do it. <laughs> There was a couple of cool things to enjoy on this week's episode of AEW Dynamite, but for the most part, I felt like I was watching a SmackDown, a two-hour show that has a pretty good opening segment and a very good end segment, but in the middle is just filled with a bunch of nonsensical trash. I don't know what it is that they're trying to do. I felt that last week they made steps in the right direction. They were starting to pull back on some of the more cringeworthy aspects of the show. But then they just, I guess, decided, screw all that. We're going to go back to what we were doing at the end of 2019. And we are going to put the Nightmare Collective at the front of this show. We're going to label this show a Legends of Memphis Wrestling show. We're going to call it an anniversary show. You could add any kind of special accoutrement to the show you want. It ends up being a giant shit sandwich. Which is the worst offense to me because you made me feel like I was watching WWE. And I feel like the more they try to emulate and copy the format of a WWE show, the more they are going to end up failing. There was so much about tonight that just screams what they're doing at the other show. Case in point, the Nightmare Collective. It is just so bad. It is so bad. Brandy Rhodes is quickly becoming the Karen Jarrett of AEW. She's becoming the equivalent of Karen Jarrett's presence in TNA to AEW. That's, that's maybe the worst thing you could be. Karen Jarrett maybe be is the only wrestling woman in history, and maybe Dixie Carter as well, but those two names are the only names you could ever think would be worse than a Stephanie McMahon. How could you be worse than Stephanie McMahon? Well, Brandy Rhodes has given that a run for its money. I don't get it. I don't understand. What happened to the Brandy Rhodes that gave this heartfelt promo that was going to bring something special to the women's division. This isn't special. This isn't what I thought you were going to bring. Some crazy ass backwards cult. Where did this come from? As far as I know, she was pretty happy. She was pretty stable. She was looking to solidify her legacy as a member of the Rhodes family. Like she was, she was poised to do something great. This is not great. This is not great. This is Wasting Awesome Kong. Awesome Kong standing around just being a minion of Brandy is just the worst thing you could possibly do with her. I don't know what her wrestling ability is because you're not allowing me to see what she can bring to the ring because all she's doing is walking around behind Brandy Rhodes collecting hair, sa hair samples from every woman on the roster. Brandy wants people to join her. Why? Why is she amassing this force? She's, what is she going to try to have a hostile takeover on her husband who owns the company? I don't get it. What is the purpose of the Nightmare Collective? What is the end game? Doesn't make sense to me. What is the purpose of bringing in a Japanese deathmatch legend from the 90s that nobody nowadays knows about? Unless you're a super fan and a tape trader from back in the day, you have no idea who Dr. Luther is, nor do you give a shit. I certainly am one of those people. I don't know who he is. I don't care who he is. When we saw the bald head in Brandy Rhodes' promo a couple of weeks back, I assumed maybe it was Vampiro, and that maybe not <laughs> that might not be the best answer either, but at least it would have lent itself to this nightmare collective, this creepy angle thing that they're doing. He's Vampiro, right? He's got history in WCW. He's part of 
wrestling lore. Like, people would know, people would get it. Dr. Luther? You guys got something for me? Because I, I don't know. I don't know why this matters. And then Mel. Melissa, whatever her name is. Why am I supposed to care about her? Why did she join Brandy's Collective? We're not giving her any explanation. We're not delving deeper into any of the important things like why. We're just giving Brandy Rhodes a live mic, having her sit on commentary, offering to explain reasons like why she's collecting hair and then doesn't do so. This is terrible TV. And then you add in all of the nonsense the Nightmare Collective brought to a World Heavyweight Championship match that could have actually turned out to be a great match. Rio and Chris Statlander were out there and it started off okay. But once the Nightmare Collective got involved and we had the reveal of Dr. Luther and, and it played into the f finish of the match, it was all wasted. All wasted time on a storyline that nobody cares about. It rivals Lana and Lashley in cringeworthy segments. Because I just can't. I can't. I don't understand it. I don't want to see this. It makes me shake my head. It makes me hang my head in embarrassment. It's doing nothing for this women's division. The focus should be on girls like Sheeta. Girls like Kong. Kong is the biggest, most badass woman you have on the roster. She should be your champion right now. Then you have women like Statlander and Brandy Rhodes and Hikaru Shida trying to take down the beast. It would have been much better. And like I said, I don't know what Kong's wrestling ability is, if she's any good anymore. I don't know. I could imagine that she at least has a better grasp on professional wrestling than some of these younger girls. And could probably, at the very least, put on a very good, entertaining match. Now, these matchups between these girls can reach that. They can get very athletic. They can be very entertaining. But then when you want to insert the Nightmare Collective, it just sends everything right down the, sh right down the gutter. It's awful. And I don't understand it. Dr. Luther. Why? Because he's a friend of Jericho? These guys got history from back in the day, so is that what we're going to start doing? Didn't they learn nothing from WCW? Once you just start hiring people based off, oh, well, he's a good friend. I owe him a favor from back in the day. We'll put him on TV, too. That's not what professional wrestling is all about. That's not going to help your show prosper, and especially when we have no clue as to who this person is. And then you got Excalibur wanting to proclaim, oh, it's Dr. Luther. Like, that's supposed to mean something to people watching around the world. And maybe it did mean something to a handful of select viewers. It meant nothing and fell on deaf ears for most of us. And maybe you shouldn't have said anything at all. Maybe Excalibur, I understand maybe he's your buddy and you know who he is, but maybe you should have played it off like, who the hell is that? And continue to add the mystery and build up towards revealing who this guy is. Not that it would have made it any better upon the reveal, but it just shows you the... Lack of thought process that they apply to stuff like this because this is garbage. This is, and it doesn't belong on AEW. They should be molding themselves after NXT, not after Raw and SmackDown because they're failing when they do things like this. And the whole Memphis Wrestling Tribute probably doesn't mean anything to anybody outside of the Memphis area. I grew up in the in the days when that whole era was was coming to its end, the territories were coming to an end. And I'm aware of the fact that Randy Savage came from Memphis Wrestling. I'm aware of the fact that the Rock and Roll Express made their way through Memphis and Mid-South and all the way up to the Northeast. I'm aware of all of this. But does it mean anything to me to be celebrating them through the eyes of Memphis? The Memphis... Re and made even worse by the fact that the most legendary wrestler from Memphis is currently the most legendarily bad commentator on Monday Night Raw right now. Without Jerry the King Lawler, a celebration in Memphis wrestling doesn't really mean jack shit since he is the most celebrated wrestler ever. And I thought that they would at the very least include Andy Kaufman in the bunch. I don't remember them mentioning any of that, but if anything, historic 
from those days needs to be made mention of Memphis wrestling, it would be something like that. The biggest angle they've ever had that gave them nationwide exposure and like, but it didn't really add to the overall presentation of the show. It didn't do anything. It was great to see Lanny Poffo again, but I thought maybe he would give us a poem or speak. I, I don't know. That's just me nitpicking at this point, but it just really didn't do anything overall for the show. The, one of the good things about this show, let's talk about some positive, was the opening matchup. The opening tag team matchup was very good. I liked the pairing of Hangman Page and Kenny Omega. If you're a fan of the show and you've watched our AEW reviews before, you know that weeks ago, once they started doing this, I jumped all over it. I thought this would be a great way to get both guys into the forefront of the fans' minds. A lot of people tuning in don't have that backlog of knowledge of what Kenny Omega has done in New Japan. A lot of the new fans don't have any idea who a Hangman Page is. So giving them this exposure in this tag team environment and making something just a little bit slightly off with Hangman Page that you know that he's going to eventually make a turn somewhere. But it's giving them spotlight. It's giving them wins. It's making them look relevant. It's giving the fans a reason to grab on to one guy or the other. And when the dissolving of the team eventually takes shape, probably leading a little bit closer into Revolution, and we have Omega versus Page, it's going to mean something more than just two former elite guys going up against each other. It's going to take on a whole new life of its own. That's proper way to do storytelling. This whole matchup with Private Party tonight is coming off of the encounter last week where Hangman Page failed to pay the 12 bucks to Private Party for the whiskey that he stole from behind the bar. So now they're trying to get their money. If they're not going to get their money, they're going to whip some ass. And tonight in this tag team matchup, it wasn't an overly spotty matchup. It had a very great pace. It was a very well executed tag team encounter. Hangman Page and... Kenny Omega get the win here and continue down this path, which is eventually going to implode. You had Pac backstage beating up Michael Nakazawa. Kenny Omega goes to run help his buddy, and Hangman Page decides to go in the crowd and start drinking people's beers. This was interesting. It was different. It was cool. We were off to an excellent start. But then we had Rio versus Chris Statlander. And the, all of the nonsense that happened with the Nightmare Collective and the show immediately went downhill from there and kind of failed to come back. They followed up the whole Rio-Chris Statlander matchup where Rio successfully defended the championship thanks to the involvement of Kong and the members of the Nightmare Collective, which was the wrong decision in, in my opinion. I, f I think the women's division needs to have that championship shifted to somebody else, and it's not really an anti Riho thing. It's just she's failing to generate any excitement. She's not really around that much, and it has to go on somebody that you want to build the division around. I don't feel like they want to build the division around Rio. I feel like they gave her the championship because she's an excellent wrestler in the ring, and she's cute, and she's Kenny's girlfriend, and she's just going to hold it until we figure out what we're going to do. But now you have a lot of new players on the board. You have characters that are interesting with Chris Statlander. You haven't done anything with B. Priestley. You haven't done shit with Britt Baker. But Rio continues to be the champion of a division that means nothing. So what good is it having her as the champion at all? They followed up the woman's segment with Sammy Guevara versus Christopher Daniels, which, once again, this was actually fine. These guys were going at it pretty good in the ring there, telling the story of Christopher Daniels don't have it anymore. And he's in this randomly put-together matchup with Sammy Guevara. But then AEW wants to book a lot of nonsense. They want to overbook things that really just take away from the match more than anything else. You have Pentagon coming out towards the end of the match screaming, Show me! He wants Christopher Daniels to show him that he's still got it, I'm assuming. This causes Christopher Daniels to lose thanks to the distraction by Penta screaming from the stage. Christopher Daniels doesn't stay focused on his match. Of course, he's going to go look at the guy in the white mask and see what he's got to say. And all he wants to say is, show me. Show me, show me. If you can. Okay. And now it ends up 
on the mat looking up at the lights, suffering a pinfall to Sammy Gravar, which then doesn't lead Pentagon to the ring to start a beatdown or anything. Pentagon decides to disappear, and the Dark Order comes out. The Dark Order comes out, and they're offering Christopher Daniels a spot in the group. Once again, I thought we were taking steps back and we were going to pull away from some of this overly gimmicky nonsense, but apparently they're going this way. However, I do have one thing that could save everything here. This segment, best case scenario, Christopher Daniels, at the end of it all, ends up being revealed as the exalted one all along. Longtime fans of, of WWE and pro wrestling that are in the know may be aware and if you're not aware, here's a little bit of a lesson for you guys. Once upon a time in the WWE, there was a higher power. He was controlling The Undertaker. He was trying to take down the WWE from within. He was doing sinister things like attacking Stephanie McMahon. He had his target set on Stone Cold Steve Austin. And nobody knew who the higher power was. There was a plan in play for Christopher Daniels, the fallen angel, to come into the WWE. And he was supposed to assume that role. It was going to be revealed to be him. Somewhere along the lines, things got complicated. I guess the deal didn't go through, and the decision was made for it to be Vince McMahon as the higher power instead. So I'm thinking, wouldn't it be interesting if Christopher Daniels doesn't accept from the Dark Order, continues to pretend to rally against the Dark Order, only to reveal in the end that he was the exalted one the whole time. Sort of as a nod to what was supposed to happen to him in his WWE run and doing something different for AEW in the process. And Evil Uno and Stu Grayson and all these other guys don't mean jack shit to me. But if you want to put them underneath the exalted one, the fallen angel Christopher Daniels, who's on his own new quest of enlightenment, trying to clean up AEW. Maybe now he's an enemy of SCU, or he continues to try to pull them in. There's some compelling stuff right there I just threw out at you. The, the possibilities are endless there. So that is a possible good thing that could end up coming out of what ended up being just another boring, same old bullshit Dark Order segment where Daniels kind of teased that he would, but ended up not joining as of right now. But wouldn't it be something if he turns out to be the exalted one in the end? Might be the best thing for this whole angle. Might be the best thing for the Dark Order altogether. And I hope they do something like that. They kind of they listen to me with the Omega and Hangman Page tag teaming. I called that shit and said it should have been a thing as soon as I seen it. And they followed kind of what I would wanted them to do. So if they're listening, why don't you take that? Make Christopher Daniels the exalted one. It'll be freaking great. He's got the charisma to do it. We had the Battle of the Brothers, which was okay. You know, it seemed unnecessary. Think about it. Cody Rhodes is feuding with MJF and company, right? Dustin is busy with Jake Hager and the Inner Circle. That's his story that they've been telling over the last couple of weeks. Pentagon and Phoenix have been messing around with SCU. They got their eyes set on the Tag Team Championship, so they want their hands on that. So why are we having this match? It's just kind of happening to happen. Did they book this matchup? Because on NXT, they were having the Dusty Rhodes Tag Team Classic begin this week, and now on AEW, they wanted to have two actual descendants of Dusty Rhodes have their own Tag Team Classic against the Lucha Brothers. It just seemed unnecessary. Dustin Rhodes is very impressive at his age. He's out there hanging and banging with the Lucha Brothers on every move. But as good as this match was, it just seemed unnecessary. Tell all of the stories you need to tell without wasting my time with stuff that doesn't make sense. It doesn't matter if it was a good match. It doesn't really make sense to what's going on. And all this was was a precursor to a promo for the head coach of the Nightmare family, Arn Anderson, to pretty much tell us nothing. He's mad that MJF is calling the shots. He wants to know who made MJF God and said that he and his client, Cody Rhodes, have to strategize and they're going to think about things and they're not going to say anything and they're going to continue to think and maybe next week we'll find out what's going on. 
okay? They followed this with MJF coming out, cutting a tremendous promo because you give the man a microphone, you're immediately engrossed into the show. MJF is fantastic. But where is the mistake here? The mistake is having Diamond Dallas Page come out, pretty much hog the spotlight, do nothing but plug his own personal shit, DDP Yoga, and his new website, and then wants to tease a comeback. Oh, maybe DDP's got one more match, and maybe this match is going to be to smack some respect into this young punk MJF. And I just feel like from the minute he stepped into the ring and started cutting his own personal promos, I couldn't take DDP seriously anymore. And honestly, he should have just went right in there, zeroed right in on MJF. He's got the ability to cut a good promo. What he said wasn't so bad once he turned his attention to what he was actually trying to do. But teasing this comeback, oh, DDP might be returning to the ring. This happening 48 hours after the WWE forcing me to watch the return of the big show just really left me feeling like, oh, why are they doing what the other guys are doing? We don't need to keep returning to the past to make the future interesting. That's Finn Balor's gimmick anyway. You don't have to do this. It's not really necessary. And it's only made worse by the fact that the Butcher and the Blade come out to assist MJF and to make sure that DDP goes down. And DDP single-handedly handles this new tag team, this new team on the scene that could have been made tonight in one quick swoop. All they had to do was beat the shit out of Diamond Dallas Page while MJF sat in the corner laughing. Two young strong men who have proven to be a force in the tag team division thus far, but now they are getting the floor wiped clean with them by Diamond Dallas Page. Dude, you guys don't see that as damaging. You don't think that makes them look like schmucks. This is something that WWE would have booked the revival to do. Go out there and get squashed by a legend, both of you, against one old man. Just go down doesn't help anybody except to make Diamond Dallas Page look like he's still got it so that we can have this ridiculous six-man tag team matchup next week on the Bash at the Beach edition of Dynamite. Going back to make the future interesting. Bash at the Beach featuring Diamond Dallas Page. Are we in 1995? I can't not bring the hammer down on it. And I can hear and feel all you little fanboys. Here's a box of tissues, all right? Wipe your baby vagina and tell me that I'm wrong. Tell me that I'm wrong. If the WWE did it, you'd expect me to shit all over it. Nobody gets a pass. Save your tears for some channel that gives a shit. Because I tell it like it is. And I call it like I see it. Whether you like it or not, you can't deny this was stupid. And it did nothing. And this ma- all they did was book the match for next week. And I'm not any more interested in that than I was the minute DDP landed two diamond cutters on both members of the Butcher and the Blade. Terrible. Terrible decision making. MJF gets away unscathed, which is the only good thing about it. But if you look at what's coming next... I really have no reason to be interested. The Best Friends wanted to take on the Jurassic Express. Six-man tag team action, because you know how much we love our six-mans. And here we go. Orange Cassidy has yet to show me any reason why everybody is such a fan of Orange Cassidy. I don't get it. He doesn't do anything. I keep hearing, oh, just wait, Mr. Nightmare. He's so great. He's actually really good. He's this. He's that. He's boring. And everybody that cheers for him, you make my head hurt. Because I don't understand what you're cheering for. A guy standing around with his hands in his fucking pockets. 
goes up to the top rope and delivers a body splash that looks like he just passed out on the top rope because he's delivering it with no effort. And he falls so unsafely on top of Jungle Boy that following Dynamite, Jungle Boy's tweeting, he may have broken a rib. Why? So that he could fall off, so Orange Cassidy can fall off the top rope like a sloth looking like an idiot? That's not wrestling. Why is this entertaining to you people? It's no better than Marco Stunt. And now you got the two worst aspects, in my opinion, of AEW in the same matchup. I like to, there to be at least an air of believability in my wrestling. That's why I don't like intergender wrestling. That's why I don't like Marco Stunt. Watching Marco Stunt wrestle and get offense on these guys and do moves is the equivalent to me of watching a Hornswoggle matchup. It's not the equivalent of Rey Mysterio. Rey Mysterio at least looked like a badass. Marco Stunt looks like a five-year-old. With Kerry Russell hair. Five-year-old male Felicity. Out there pulling off offense in big spots. And everybody cheering because the Luchasaurus is throwing him around. Well, that's cool. I guess neither one of these men bring anything to the teams or the men that they are involved with. Orange Cassidy is boring as shit. Marco Stunt is unbelievably unbelievable and not in a good way. You cannot believe anything you see with your eyes and it takes away from professional wrestling. You have to suspend your disbelief to understand that these two men are capable of beating each other's ass. And you're going to tell me that you're watching a guy like Trent get beat up by a Marco stunt, and you're like, yeah, I can buy that. You got to be better than that. Got to be smarter than that. It's not my taste. I don't agree with it. Like I said, think of any matchup you want featuring Hornswoggle, WWE based or not. That's what I'm seeing. It's just like Hornswoggle beating Seth Rollins or or anybody on a bigger level than him. You going to be all right with that? Of course not. The Jurassic Express get the win here. That's the only good thing. They continue to build momentum for Jungle Boy and the Luchasaurus who I was a huge fan of until they brought the third guy into a mix. And the same thing for the best friends. I thought they were going to be a great tag team. Chuck and Trent, they were working out just great. Why they had to involve Orange Cassidy, I don't know. It does nothing but drag everything down for me. That's my opinion. You can, you can have a difference of opinion. You could enjoy all of these things, and there's nothing wrong with that. And there's nothing wrong with you for feeling those things. And you could voice your difference of opinion in the comments section down below. Just be respectful or you'll find yourself on the outs looking in. As always, there's no three fucking strike policy here. You piss me off one time, you're gone. So be respectful and you could be the counterpoint, but don't be a dick. It's, it's that simple. Then we have Jericho coming out. He wants his answer from John Moxley. John Moxley makes his entrance the minute he entered the arena. He's got his coat on and it's zipped up to his neck. And there would be no reason for him to come out that way unless he was wearing an inner circle shirt. And as I mentioned last week on our review, I said what they're going to do is they're going to pull... A DDP. Interestingly enough, I didn't think DDP was going to be part of this show tonight, and that ended up happening. But famously, back in the 90s, at the height of the NWO, all they wanted to do was recruit Diamond Dallas Page. They went about it in a very similar way, offering him all kinds of separate little add-ons. They didn't offer him a Ford GT. They didn't offer him 50%, nearly 50% of the NWO, but... It was very similar in its execution, and I thought for sure that Moxley was going to join the inner circle and then immediately snap and start dropping bodies, and they were going to 
mimic one of the greatest moments in WCW history. And while it would have been somewhat of an homage to that, I would have been okay with it. And the way they went about it tonight was fine. I mean, I, I felt like it was maybe just a little bit too long. A little bit too long before the reveal. It's almost as if they were filling time in there in order to wait for that, you know, 9.59 minute where you got to go home and make that final swerve and get the fans on everybody's side. And it was fine. It was fine. It got the fans to pop. It was a great way for the show to go off the air. But I feel like maybe they missed an opportunity here. And this isn't a, a mistake per se, but think about this for a second. There was an element of surprise for most people who were watching when John Moxley revealed that he was going to join the inner circle and that he wanted to be dominant and nothing will be more dominant than the force that they would have amassed as a faction with Jericho and him at the head of everything. And the longer it went on, the more it felt like, okay, maybe they're not going to do the double turn. Maybe Moxley is joining the inner circle. And that might have been done by design, but imagine the show went off the air and John Moxley was now in the inner circle. I think the rest of us would probably be going berserk right now. Like, the wrestling world wouldn't be able to believe it, and we would all be probably shitting on it too. Oh, why would Moxley join the inner circle? And we would have our opinions on it, and they would be strong, and we'd bring the hammer down on it, and we wouldn't understand it. But in weeks to come, it could have made for some good TV. You could have had Moxley messing with the inner circle from within. You know, teasing Chris Jericho here and there, keeping them on edge. It would have made for some interesting stuff going down. And then you could have had him make that final swerve, which we all would have probably seen coming all along as we got a little bit closer to Revolution leading up to build up the match. But now it's happened and there's nothing wrong with it and we're going to go down this road. I'm sure the inner circle are now going to be looking for revenge as John Moxley made it out of there with that Ford GT. So now he has that car which is great, and Jericho is going to be pissed off as soon as he wakes up from the paradigm shift and the bottle of champagne that was bashed across his skull by Dean Ambrose before the night is over. Maybe a missed opportunity to have a little bit of fun and to really swerve the the AEW audience, but at the end of this thing, it was just fine. Jon Moxley is a man on his own terms who lives in his own rules, and we are going to see him on his quest for the AEW Championship, he's going to take it away from Chris Jericho. I feel like it's almost a given. It almost has to happen. Chris Jericho has been the champion long enough now that if Moxley takes it from him, it's going to be a big deal. And moving forward with AEW, with Moxley on top, may be the better decision in the end. Now, AEW Dynamite this week was, for the most part, a tremendously disappointing and confusing dud. But, I like the direction they're going with Paige and Omega. I'm looking forward to the conclusion of that storyline as we go down the line. And the obvious John Moxley versus Chris Jericho encounter that's coming our way is probably going to be epic. And while I know you guys, for the most part, are going to agree with me, I also know that there are plenty of AEW fans that are watching this that probably have turned away at this point that are going to hate My guts, this is always the worst video of the week. It gets the worst reviews because you guys are too sensitive and can't accept criticism. And even when I'm nice to the show like I was last week, you just want to be mad at me about it. So I don't care. I'm buckling down. I'm I'm ready for whatever the hell you guys want to send my way because the one thing you can say about me is that I'm honest over anything else. And I'm not playing favorites. And when you make me mad and when you make the hammer have to come down, that's exactly what's going to happen just like it does following every major wrestling show right here on sledgehammer tv don't forget to hit that subscribe button right now and become one of the members of youtube that know that when you want your wrestling news bullshit free full of honesty and fun entertainment this is the place to be make sure you got all your notifications on and then smash that like button if i made you laugh if i made you cry if i made you understand why this show sucked 
hit that thumbs up right now. Share this video with each and every one of your wrestling buddies all over the wrestling world, especially if maybe they're a little bit too high on their AEW horse and they need to be knocked down a peg. This is the perfect video for you to allow them to do so. And thank you all for your continued love and support of Sledgehammer TV. T-shirts are still available. Bonfire.com slash door slash Sledgehammer dash TV. I'm pretty sure the campaign is going to go through the month of January and then that will be it. And we'll try to come up with something new for you guys. And as always, if you didn't know, the Poop Hammer segment of the night definitely goes to anything involving Brandy Road. So there you go. There you have it. That's your AEW Dynamite review. NXT this week, vastly superior. AEW may win in the ratings, but NXT's really got their shit going on all cylinders. And we'll talk about that too later on on this channel. So stay tuned. Make sure you're subscribed. My name is Nick Nightmare. This is the team Thor the Sledgehammer, the official Sledgehammer of the Sledgehammer Wrestling Show. His tag team partner, the world heavyweight champion of all the microphones in all the world, Mr. Blue the Snowball, the most important member of the team, as always, is each and every one of you. That's going to do it, and we are out of here. And we will see you next time right here on your new favorite wrestling show, the Sledgehammer Wrestling Show, only on Sledgehammer TV, right here on YouTube.com. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.